So, on a Saturday, we catch up with Leith Van Onselen, one of two brains behind macrobusiness.com.au. He's from the Treasury of Common Sense, and I'm delighted to say he's on the line. How are you, Leith? G'day, Luke. How's things? Yeah, things are really, really good. I hope they are with you, my friend. Yeah, not too bad, mate. I hope you enjoyed your holiday. I had a terrific time, a terrific time. I must tell you about it all off air at some point. But um, before us this morning, and I'm concerned about this, and by the way, I enjoyed reading Macro Business while I was away, mate. It's one thing I did do each day. There are a couple of other things that I won't mention here. The, uh, the new energy shock. What is the new energy shock? Yeah, so listeners know, you've obviously seen it in your energy bills that for the past several years, you've seen your gas and your electricity prices rocket. And the reason why they've rocketed primarily is because on the east coast of Australia, we're the only gas exporting jurisdiction in the world that does not reserve our gas for domestic use. And despite the fact that we export over 70% of the gas on the east coast to China and Japan and these other places, and we export so much to it, of it to those places that they actually re-export it for profit. Um, we've created a domestic gas shortage and we've driven up the cost of gas on the East Coast to extortionate levels. And that's also obviously, well, that, that's also increased electricity prices because gas is used as a firming power for electricity. So whenever we don't have enough renewables to meet electricity demand or enough coal, we always use gas as the backstop. And when you make your gas prices expensive, it then forces up your electricity costs. So we've been hit twice. And we received some more bad news, as reported in the Australian Financial Review, that New South Wales gas customers have just received notification from AGL Energy Origin Energy Australia that from the 1st of August, the gas bills are going to rise by another 10%. Yay. So another 10% on top of the massive gas right, the price rises we've had over the past several years. So this just keeps getting worse, Luke. You know, one of the things you said there, I hope it hasn't been lost in our conversation, but we we have a shortage of, uh, of gas here at home. We have a shortage of affordable gas here. Actually, we don't have any shortage of gas. We've got more gas than we, we know what to do with. But we don't have uh, an available affordable supply uh, here domestically. But we, we, we export gas to other countries who then receive that gas and they on sell it, don't they, Leith? That's right. Unfortunately, we, we export more than what Japan and China need, and we sell it to them on very cheap long-term contracts while we pay way more than that at home for our own gas. And then as a result, they're selling it for profit. Hmm. And, you know, we're, if we end up building import terminals, which is one of the harebrained solutions to this, rather than just reserving it for domestic use, we could end up ex- re-importing our own gas. Yeah. It's just absurd, and, and, and this is creating a whole bunch of problems. I mean, obviously, we've got an inflation problem in Australia and a cost of living crisis, obviously, and obviously these, you know, this, this 10% increase in gas is going to feed directly into Australia's inflationary pressures. It also guarantees that we're going to have higher income taxes. So as, as everyone saw that the, the federal budget uh, has, has uh, implemented a whole bunch of energy subsidies, well, those energy subsidies are going to have to become permanent because if we keep having these extortionally high gas prices because we've stuffed the market up, well, the federal government's going to keep dishing out subsidies, which means we're going to pay through that through our taxes. And all it means is that those subsidies will effectively be going to the you know foreign-owned gas companies instead yeah. of just doing the right thing and reserving our gas, which is what every other place in the world does. And it's kind of a, a, akin to what you do it in New South Wales with transurban. You know, everyone's transurban tolls get subsidised by the state government. Well, that's yes. coming from your taxes. Yes. And that ends up going to transurban. Yes. Rather than just fixing the whole problem. And it's also going to wreck the energy transition. So the whole idea of the energy transition was that we're meant to close down coal, replace it with gas, and then build out renewables. Mm-hmm. Because gas is the perfect fuel mm-hmm. for electricity generation because it's you can turn it on and off in an instant. You can't do that with nuclear. You can't do that with coal, et cetera. So it's the perfect uh, it's the perfect fuel to run alongside renewables because renewables are by nature very intermittent. Mm. So, you know, obviously they're they're great when the sun's shining, the wind's blowing, but at all other times you need a backstop, and the best backstop is gas because you can just turn it on and off at a whim. Mm. But we've made gas so expensive that then that's feeding the whole energy price, uh, the energy cost inflation, and then as a result, we're now prolonging the life of coal-fired power stations like in Earing, Earing in New South Wales, where 
the state government's actually using your money to subsidise the coal station to stay open for longer, which is going to Origin, who which is one of the gas exporters. It's <laughs> absolutely absurd. <laughs> Rather than just fixing the fixing the gas market, so we have cheap and abundant gas like everywhere else in the world does. And I've said it before that America is now the biggest gas exporting region in the world. And Americans pay two dollars fifty US a gigajoule, which is about four dollars Australian. We pay between twelve and twenty five, depending on the day. Jeez. So we pay with three to six times what Americans pay, even though we we export more than seventy percent of it. Yeah. And here's the other thing that's that's ridiculous, Luke. We're all being told that we need to, you know, get off gas because it's a greenhouse, you know, it, it adds to emissions, blah, blah, blah. We actually use more gas converted to liquid than all of Australian households use so that we can then put on a ship, sell it to China, so that then China can burn our gas. The whole thing is just absurd. And, and while we're doing this, we've got all our, our entire uh, manufacturing sector is closing down because they can't afford to compete in the world market because its energy prices are too high. So we've just also... Uh, wrecking the economy and, and ensuring that our economy is less diversified mm. than it should be. And then also more reliant on China for imports yeah. and everything else. Yeah. So we've we just, we just completely messed this up. And all Albo needed to do is that the outbreak of the Russia-Ukraine war was triggered the Australian domestic gas security mechanism, which is a reservation uh, mechanism which was brought in by the Turnbull government and which basically allowed the federal government to reserve gas in times of crisis, and elbows refused to do it. And, it's, and as a result, we're all paying the cost for a high cost of living, higher energy prices, manufacturing shutting down, et cetera, et cetera. It's just absolute policy lunacy that we can be, a, you know, one of the world's biggest gas exporters, but also have a domestic shortage and pay some of the world's highest prices. Mm. You couldn't, mm. you know, mess it up even more. It's like a you know, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or Iran paying $2 a litre for their petrol and then saying, oh, sorry, guys, we've got a shortage while well, they sell it all offshore and then having to build import terminals to import oil. That's kind of the absurdity of the situation we have in Australia. It's all from policy failure. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've uh, we've raised that comparison before. If you want to buy petrol in the Middle East, I think that one or two countries, it's about 30 cents a litre. Now, you'd think with all our gas we get the same benefit because it's here, but uh, as Leith explained, we don't. I, I saw this, and you just shake your head. The 2023 edition of the UBS Global Wealth Report released during the week and showed that Australian households were the second richest in the world. Now, you know, cost of living, anyone? That's madness, isn't it? Can't be right, Yeah, surely. it is. And it all gets down to one thing, Luke. It's because we've got some of the most expensive housing in the world that we're supposedly rich. So the the way the uh, the UBS Global Wealth Report works is it's just basically it, you know, it it tallies up what our household assets are worth. And you know, surprise, surprise, Australia's household assets are concentrated in housing, whereas in the US it's seventy percent in financial assets. In Asia, it's about sixty percent. We're way well over half just in housing. And because we've got expensive housing, we're presto wealth, uh, very wealthy. Even though we got, we pay some of the, we have some of the world's highest mortgage debt. We're all struggling with mortgage repayments. We have a younger generation that cannot afford housing. They can barely even afford to rent. They can only buy homes with the bank of mum and dad. And you know, is a nation really wealthy if its younger citizens cannot afford to house themselves without parental help? Mm. It just shows you how these these surveys are just absolutely absurd. And I'd argue that Australia would be quote unquote wealthier if we never had this massive run up in house prices. And the median home price was say 370,000 instead of 750,000 and Australia's household debt was half of what it was. Like, you know, I'll, I'll use my example personally. I bought my house, uh, my second house uh, in 2006 for 1.2 mil in Melbourne. I would have much rather have paid 600K for it and not still have a mortgage like I do now. Yeah. I'd be much better off because I'm living in my house regardless. It doesn't matter if it's worth $1 million, $2 million, $5 million. A house is a house. It's that, That's all it is. And if you don't have an investment property, it really doesn't matter if it goes up or down. And, um, you know, I'm notionally wealth, wealthy according to this, you know, this survey, but I'd be actually much better off if I didn't have a mortgage because I got it way cheaper. And also I've got two young children who will need to buy housing in 10 years or so. And I look at their future and they're completely stuffed. Yeah. Because of this high housing. So yeah. it's just another thing whereby, you know, Australians are supposedly wealthy, even though the younger generation can't even afford to buy a house, even if you're on a good income, which to me is not 
the uh, the hallmark of a wealthy country or a successful country or an egalitarian country. Do you sit, I wonder, at home, look at the the financial or the economic debates that we deal with in this country on a daily basis in the mainstream media and elsewhere and think to yourself, that is such a small order issue because it seems to me every time we speak, there's really big things that a government with half an interest in the people might just do something about, but uh, they never seem to do anything about it. Do you sit at home and think, gee, you guys are just so far from removed from where the real problems are? You'd have to, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think pol- politics is the art of distraction. So I was seeing it a bit with this uh, WA senator, uh, I can't remember her name, Payman or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's basically been, you know, it's taken up the, the media for 10 days. And then meantime, I'm looking at this gas crisis that we've got whereby everyone's about to have their bills go up 10% again on top of the other 40 or 50% that it's gone up or doubled or tripled, whatever it is, the last few years where it's just gone through the roof. And I'd argue that they should be focusing on that, not this other stuff. Uh, and, you know, we see it all the time. It's um, unfortunately... As I said, politics is the art of distraction, and and they, and they like to distract on issues that aren't, to me, national significance. Yeah. And unfortunately, the big issues of national national significance, so you know, housing, the rental crisis, energy, uh, those sorts of things, cost of living, are the things they should be focusing on, and also the over reliance on income taxes. I must say as well. Yeah. Uh, and 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 the broken taxes. We're not we're not getting nearly enough tax from our resource base. We don't tax that properly at all. And, you know, the way the whole system is up, it, uh, set up, it's set up to fail and to make us poorer. And they should be tackling those sorts of things. Mm. But instead, we just get all these distractions and sideshows. Um, unfortunately, that's the way it's been for years. It's, it's certainly as long as I've been doing macro business for 12 years. Yeah. Right, mate. Great to chat. Uh, take care. We'll talk to you next weekend. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Macrobusiness.com.au.